Greetings and great blessings to you tonight and welcome to the Main Street Church of God in Christ and our 2022 Black History Commemoration. We thank God that we have something to praise and worship him for because we are a proud people because the Lord has indeed prospered us throughout the ages. So many inventors, brilliant minds, athletes, uh, people that have changed literally the way the world works that come directly from our bloodline that look exactly like us. And so tonight we're going to celebrate for just this hour. We're going to celebrate the contributions of some of those people to the world. And we are so grateful and thankful that you have decided to come and to connect and worship with us tonight. So we're going to ask you, as is our custom, to do your part in digital evangelism. Like and share. And when you have shared, please put in the comment section that one word, shared. We want to do what we can to get this out because we know that one way that we can keep from repeating the bad parts of our history is to know where we have come from to understand where it is that God is taking us to. So tonight, as you're coming in, like and and share we have an amazing commemoration for you tonight and we pray that you are blessed by the worship the presentations the readings just everything we put this together with you in mind we're so grateful and thankful uh, for mother ingrid mcnair stalker for years uh, she has championed this cause for main street and she continues to do so and we thank god for the excellence with which she does what she does and so we're not going to prolong the time at all. We're going to go into the sanctuary to this service already in progress. Uh, as we know, this is the time of the year for honoring uh, our black people whom have gone on. And we just des we decide to do an honoring of them. Uh, in our services and we are thankful most of all because God knows always what's going on and we just want to give thanks but we also want to let you know just how thankful we are so if you would bow your heads and pray with me Father God Lord Truly, in the name of Jesus, we are so thankful. We are thankful because you're the one, Almighty God, that makes our lives bearable. We are so thankful, Almighty God, for those that you gave us to be teachers unto us that have gone on. Almighty God, we are so thankful for this time of black history and those that have taught us so much about our nationality, Almighty God, and we are trusting to know that you are whom that you say that you are, and that is God Almighty, and that you are Him all by yourself, needing no help from anyone, Almighty God, nor anything. We ask that you bless these services, Almighty God, that we are rendering, Almighty God, and most of all, we are thankful for the black man that you have given us, Almighty God, from your heart, our pastor, Pastor Clay, we ask that you bless him and his family, Almighty God, to the utmost. And we are so thankful, Almighty God, that we are a part of this endeavor, Almighty God, and we are trusting always in you, believing, having no doubt, even while that we are in prayer. And we just want to thank you for it right now in Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen. And I will be reading for your hearing Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, as well as James chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 12. And the word of the Lord reads, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. James 1 and 2, My brethren, Count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. I'm going to skip down to verse 12. 
Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. The word of the Lord is blessed.
persevered in the midst of pain, mistreatment, abuse, lynchings, segregation, discrimination, Jim Crow antics, the KKK tortures, all while living on low wages, poor housing, constant opposition to better or higher education, better jobs, higher pay. Yet we, the resilient people, not only survived, we thrived. The God-given talents came forth in many forms, such as literature and poetry. Here are a few examples. George Marion McClellan. George Marion McClellan was born at Belfast, Tennessee in 1860. He was educated at Fisk University and at the Hartford Theological Seminary. He is a gentle poet of nature, of the seasons, of birds and flowers, and woodland scenes. His work is after the long accepted patterns, but possesses a distinct charm. His best poems are collected in The Path of Dreams, written in 1916. He is exceptional in that writing when and where he did, this collection contains no dialect poetry. Here are a couple of his poems. First, A Butterfly in Church by George Marion McClellan. What dost thou hear, thy shining, sinless thing, with many colored hues and shapely wing? Why quit the open field in summer air to flutter here? Thou hast no need of prayer. Tis meet that we who this great structure built should come to be redeemed and washed from guilt. For we, this gilded edifice within, are come with erring hearts and stains of sin. But thou art free from guilt as God on high. Go, seek the blooming waste and open sky. And leave us here our secret woes to bear confessionals and agonies of prayer. And then we have the feet of Judas, also by George Marion McClellan. Christ washed the feet of Judas, the dark and evil passions of his soul, his secret plot and sordidness complete, his hate, his purpose Christ knew the whole, and still in love he stooped and washed his feet. Christ washed the feet of Judas, yet all his lurking sin was bare to him, his bargain with the priest, and more than this, in Olivet beneath the moonlight dim, aforehand knew and felt his treacherous kiss. Christ washed the feet of Judas, and so ineffable his love twas meet, that pity filled his great forgiving heart, and tenderly to wash the traitor's feet, who in his Lord had basely sold his part. Christ washed the feet of Judas, and thus a girded servant self abased, taught that no wrong this side the gate of heaven was ever too great to wholly be effaced, and though unasked, in spirit be forgiven. And so if we have ever felt the wrong of trampled rights, of caste, it matters not. Whatever the soul has felt or suffered long, O oh heart, this one thing should not be forgot. Christ washed the feet of Judas. And then we have James David Carruthers. James David Carruthers was born in Cass County, Michigan in 1869. His mother died at his birth and his father gave him very little care or attention. During his youth, he gained a livelihood through many kinds of occupation. 
He worked in the sawmills and lumber camps of his native state, was a sailor on the lakes, a coachman, a janitor, and for a time, a boot black in a barber shop. Through friends, two of them were Henry D. Lord and Francis E. Willard. He was encouraged to get an education. As a young man, he entered the ministry and continued in that profession throughout his life. Carothers wrote a number of poems that were first published in the Century Magazine. These poems attracted wide attention. National sentiment of a generation ago made his At the Closed Gate of Justice a much quoted poem. Consider in its time and within the limits of its mood, it is a moving poem. And two, it is a poem that no Negro or black poet of today would think of writing. In spirit, he shows kinship with some of the pre-Dunbar poets, but of course it's beyond comparison with them in scholarship and skill. His dialect poetry is modeled closely after Dunbar's. He is the author of two volumes of poetry, Selected Poems, written in 1907, and The Dream and the Song, written in 1914. He also published The Black Cat Club, a series of sketches originally contributed as special articles to several of the Chicago Daily Newspapers, and in spite of handicap, written in 1916, an autobiography. Here is his poem at the closed gate of justice by James D. Carruthers. To be a Negro in a day like this demands forgiveness, bruised with blow on blow, portrayed like him whose woe dim eyes gave bliss. Still must one succor those who brought one low to be a Negro in a day like this. To be a Negro in a day like this demands rare patience, patience that can wait in other darkness. Tis the path to miss and knock unheeded at an iron gate to be a Negro in a day like this. To be a Negro in a day like this demands strange loyalty we serve a flag which is to us white freedom's emphasis. Ah, one must love when truth and justice lag. To be a Negro in a day like this. To be a Negro in a day like this. Alas, Lord God, what evil have we done? Still shines the gate, all gold and amethyst. But I pass by the glorious goal unwon. Merely a Negro in a day like this. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies Of liberty Let our rejoice Faith that the dark path has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the presence has brought us. Faith in the right. Oh, 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 oh. 
into this place for which our father signed. Oh, come to the place for which our fathers, the tears that have been watered, we have come. Treading our path through the blood of the Lord. Out from the gloomy past, now we stand where the white. Right star is cast. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us far, far Our God, where we met let our hearts drink with the wine of the world. We I am so glad once again to be bringing to you our annual Black History Commemoration Services here at the Main Street Church of God in Christ. We certainly hope and pray that you will hear and receive something that is encouraging and beneficial to you. And once again, I would like to thank my pastor, Pastor Brandon Clay, for the opportunity to sponsor the Black History Program. This year, our theme is a resilient people overcoming the struggles of the past. From the time of the first slaves were brought over on the slave ships, the Negro has endured extreme pain, abuse, brutality, cruel beatings, and lynchings, and more. All forms of hatred and downright meanness, mainly at the hands of the white man. They were brought over on packed slave ships, chained together, laying flat, layer on layer on top of layer. They endured the misery for days, yes, for weeks at a time. They almost suffocated from the stench of urine and human feces that covered their bodies. Once in America, they were placed on the auction blocks and were auctioned off to the highest bidder based on their muscles and their strength. They were subjected to cruel, back-breaking labor in the hot fields, in the heat and sun, from sunup to sundown. Still, they pressed on. 
the women who worked in the houses and in the yard and in the garden had to cook the meals and keep the houses clean, keep them spotless. They had to answer to the slave master's wife every request, every beck and call before they could even tend to their own families. They had to breastfeed the madam's baby before they could breastfeed their own baby. Many times their own babies died from hunger and malnutrition. Many times the brave men had to watch without being able to say a word while the slave master went in and slept with their wives. If he tried to speak up or object, he would be beaten or even killed. Those who tried to escape to freedom were chased down by dogs and angry men on horseback with rifles and whips. If they were caught, they would be beaten brutally or even lynched. Still many tried and they were brave enough to try again and again to escape. They had a thirst and a hunger for freedom, for a better way of life without the cruelty of inhumane conditions. And yes, there were many who were successful and did escape to the north to freedom. Matthew 5 and 6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I can see these slaves with a hunger and a thirst for freedom. They didn't let anything get in their way. They were determined that one day they would be free. They had a faith. They had a hope that they held on to in spite of suffering. We as Christians today, we must have a hunger and a thirst after righteousness, a hunger and a thirst for God, a hunger and a thirst for his word, for the anointing in our lives, for a greater walk with him. The slaves were determined. They were steadfast in their plans to get to freedom. They persevered through the pains and sufferings of slavery. They were steadfast in their quest for freedom. No matter how bad, no matter how hard and severe the treatment, no matter how many were shot or hung or lynched, they endured the cruel pain and extreme suffering, holding on for a better life, for a brighter day. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, But be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for inasmuch as ye know your work, your labor is not in vain. They were steadfast in their quest for freedom. The slaves were determined I can hear them thinking to themselves, it's not going to be like this always. There is a better way. There is a better day coming. And they were determined to get there. They were resilient, even in the midst of their suffering. And we as saints, we have got to be steadfast in our walk with the Lord. We've got to be determined to live for him, to draw nigh unto him to have his anointing in our lives as we go about doing his will. Be ye steadfast, unmovable. Don't faint, don't waver, don't give up. Hold on and do what the Lord has called us to do. The slaves were smart and they were shrewd. They developed secret codes and ways of communicating their plans to escape. From one house to the next, from one plantation to the next, as to when it was safe to leave or should they wait. Also, they waited to be sure which way to go, which direction. Even the patterns on their quilts that they hung on the line gave a secret route to freedom that only the slaves could read and follow. Harriet Tutman, a slave escape e herself, became known as the Moses of her people. Bravely, daringly, she rescued more than 300 slaves and led them to freedom up north. 
her dangerous, heroic, and successful exploits became known as the Underground Railroad. Despite the huge dead or alive bounty on her head, she still organized and led 19 trips back into the deep south to guide slave runaways up north to freedom. They went through a complicated network of way stations. These were safe houses along the way. Good people, yes, some white people who were brave enough to provide shelter and rest and food for the runaway slaves. Harriet Tubman made one last trip down south to get her own parents, and she brought them to safety up north, and this was in 1857. Harriet Tubman was resilient. She was brave. She was determined, fearless. The black people are, have been, and still are a resilient people. Through pain and suffering, risk of their lives for freedom, through years, yes, even decades, on decades and decades of oppression and suffering, their determination did not waver. They pressed on. Matthew 24 and 13 says, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. They endured the pain and the suffering. They were determined to make it to freedom. They endured. We as saints, as Christians, we've got to endure suffering, pain, misery, acne, trials, whatever problems we may have. We have to learn to endure. Don't faint. Don't fall by the wayside. Don't give up. Hold on. We want to make it to the end. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Don't give up. Sometimes you have to encourage yourself on this way. But hold on. Know that God is with you and he will take you through. Many slaves had had to learn to read by candlelight at night in secret. Because if the master found out, he would punish them. Yes, there were even some white people who secretly taught the slaves how to read. Out of the pain and suffering came poets, authors, educators, scientists, doctors, lawyers, politicians, musicians, government workers, actors, builders, inventors, and on and on. Gifts and talents came forth. Out of the suffering, they came forth. There are over 100 inventions that came forth through the suffering. Black people, invented over 100 different products and items and things that are still useful today. But for most of them, they never received credit. Just a few of those things that were invented by black people are the air conditioning unit by Frederick Jones in 1949, the baby buggy by William Richardson in 1889, blood plasma bag by Charles Drew, 1945, the chamber commode by Thomas Elkins, 1897, the clothes dryer by George T. Sampson, 1971, the electric lamp bulb by Louis Latimer, 1882, yes, and even the elevator. When you get on an elevator, remember that Alexander Miles, a black man, invented it. 1867, the fire extinguisher, Thomas Marshall, 1872, the fountain pen, Walter Purvis, 1890, the gas mask, Garrett Morgan, 1914, peanut butter, oh yeah, peanut butter. Next time you eat some, remember that George Washington Carver invented peanut butter along with hundreds of other things from the peanut. In eight, he did that in 1896. The spark plug, Edmund Burgeon, 1839. 
the straightening comb ladies by Madam C.J. Walker in 1905 and the traffic light, yes, the traffic light by a black man, Garrett Morgan, 1923. And let us remember that the renowned pediatrician, a pe pediatric neurosurgeon, Dr. Ben Carson, is known for so many sur surgeries in saving children's lives, neurosurgeon. Even after the Emancipation Proclamation, there was still segregation and discrimination in the schools, on jobs, doors were closed in black people's faces. Segregation on buses and all forms of transportation. Let us not forget the Montgomery bus boycott that was in 1955. It ran for 381 days. The black people came together in Montgomery and boycotted the buses and they were the cause of segregated buses ending. They were held back, pushed aside, pushed down, overlooked for raises and promotion on their jobs. They were not able to buy homes in the nicer neighborhoods and not allowed to enter the better, higher institutions of learning. However, the resilient black people founded their own schools and colleges and universities through the determination and insight of such visionaries as Mary McLeod Berthoon, who founded Berthoon-Cookman College. She believed that education provided the key to racial advancement. She devoted her life to ensure the right to education and freedom from discrimination for African Americans. Then there was Booker T. Washington, an educator, a reformer, the first president and principal developer of Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute, which is now Tuskegee University. He was the most influential spokesman for black Americans between 1895 and 1915. There are today over 100 historically black colleges and universities in the United States of America, most of which were founded and organized and financed by black people through hard labor and ingenuity and tenacity. Many, many African Americans have made sacrifices. They sacrificed their time, their labor, their money, their property, and yes, even their lives. They made contributions and inventions, services, and on and on for the betterment of themselves, for their families, and for all African Americans. There are too many to name, and some of them are unknown. Just a few are Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who created Negro History Week, which became Black History Month in 1976. Then there's Dorothy Hyatt, May C. Jemison, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Sojourner Truth, Colin Powell, Frederick Powell, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Langston Hughes, W.E.B. Du Bois, Cicely Tyson, Jane, John Lewis, Emmett Till, Louis Armstrong, Hank Aaron, Barack Obama, Thurgood Marshall, Jackie Robinson, Malcolm X, Condoleezza Rice, Kamala Harris, Maya Angelou, Oprah Winfrey, Frederick Douglass, Josephine Baker, and then there were some who sacrificed their lives as children. Denise McNair, Anna Mae Collins, Carol Robertson, and Cynthia Wesley. Those are the four little girls that were killed in the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing in September 1963. Denise McNair, as most of you know, was my niece. Many civil rights activists have made, and some still are today, very actively involved in promoting civil rights of all citizens, all races, especially black people. Equal rights and voting rights to bring about fair and equal treatment to all areas of life. 
for all people, especially black people. When we look at the resilience and tenacity, the perseverance, the determination, the hope and the faith of the black people down through history, when you consider the horrific sufferings that were put up on them, then you can consider how they survived, how they thrived, how they obtained more. And yes, they obtained more and better consideration. You will see the one reason why we have come thus far. You can understand that we are indeed a resilient people. We are rising above the suffering, surviving and thriving, contributing to society, inventing, succeeding, and encouraging others to succeed. We are yet, to this day, we are overcoming the struggles of our past. We're not giving up. James 1, 2, and 3 states, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse or various temptations, which are trials. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith, the testing of your faith, worketh patience, produces patience. Verse 12 says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, that goes through the trial. For when he is tried, when he is tested and proven, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So when you go through your problems, your tests, your trials, Count it for joy. Give God praise. You're not praising him for the problem, but you're praising him in the midst of the problem. Know that he's with you. Know that these things come upon you, but he is not leaving you alone. And one reason you're going through is because you're saved and sanctified. The enemy is mad. He doesn't want you to hold on. He doesn't want you to go through, but hold on. So count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. When, when stuff begins to happen, count it joy and give him praise. Knowing that he's with you and he's going to bring you through. Isaiah 43 and 2, one of my favorite scriptures. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shall not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. It won't scarch you. The Lord has promised to be with us when we go through. Be encouraged, saints. God is faithful. He doesn't forget his promises. He knows us. He loves us. He knows what's going on in our lives. And he wants to be there to help us. All we got to do is believe. All we got to do is trust him. We can make it. He wants us to make it. Hold on. Keep the faith. Walk upright and serve the Lord. I thank God for the slaves that went on before. I believe that many of them were trying to serve him and do all they could. They prayed earnestly for freedom to be delivered. And they didn't give up. They didn't faint. They held on. They persevered. They are a good example for us today to hold on to, to persevere through what we're going through. There are many people today, many blacks today that are doing well, that have accomplished much, much then went through so many different problems and suffering to attain what they have attained today. Let us hold on to faith. Hold on to God. Because problems are still coming. Blacks are still being killed. It's only been within recent years that we have seen police officers who have wrongly killed blacks be prosecuted and convicted. But God is faithful. Don't give up. I like Maya Angelou's poem, Still I Rise. Because so much in that poem is saying that regardless of what we have gone through, we have come up, we have rose, we have risen, and we are yet doing that. When we go through our problems, know that we will rise. Just give it to Jesus. I thank God for each of you today. I hope something has been said to help you, to strengthen and encourage you to hold on and to know as a people we are resilient and we will rise. God bless you. I've had some good days And I've had some hills to climb 
I've had some weary days and some sleepless nights but when I look around and began to think things over all of my good days they outweigh my bad days and I won't, I won't complain. Sometimes the clouds hang low and I can hardly see the road. I the question, Lord, Lord, why so much pain? But He knows what's best for me. Although my weary eyes just can't see but I'll just say thank you Lord and I won't I won't complain for God has been good to me He's been good to me more than this world could ever be. He's been good to today so I'll just say thank you Lord and I won't I won't complain for God has been so good to me He's, he's been good to me More than this world could ever be He's been good to me turn my midnights into day so instead of complaining I'll just say thank you Lord you've been good to me thank you Lord you brought me through thank you Lord and I Oh, God 
Alaska. You turn my midnight into day. So instead of complaining, I'll just say thank you, Lord. You've been wonderful. Thank you, Lord. You brought me through. Thank you, Lord. You made ways out of no way. Thank you, Lord. And I, I won't complain. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for God has been good to me. Woo. Hallelujah. He's, he's been good to me. More than this world could ever be. He's been so good to me. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He dried all of my tears away. He turned my midnights into day. So instead of complaining, just tell him, thank you, Lord. You're so wonderful, thank you, Lord. You brought me through, thank you, Lord. And I won't, I won't complain. Thank you, Jesus. Tonight, I have the privilege of introducing our speaker. Birmingham native Lisa McNair is the oldest living sister of Denise McNair, one of the four girls killed in the infamous 1963 bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Denise was an only child at the time of her death. Almost exactly one year from the day she was murdered, Lisa was born. Raised in Birmingham, Lisa attended public and private schools and later attended college at the University of Alabama, both Tuscaloosa and Birmingham campuses. She worked 18 years at the Greater Birmingham Convention and Visitors Bureau, promoting tourism and was instrumental in helping to develop civil rights historic tours in the greater Birmingham area. Later, she spent seven years working full time in her family's business, Chris McNair Studios and Art Gallery. Presently, she is a professional photographer with her own business, Posh Photographers. She is also a national public speaker Lisa shares the story of Denise's life, her heinous murder, how it affected her parents and the city of Birmingham. She also speaks on racial reconciliation and how we must all remember that as human beings, we have more things in common than we have that are different. She also conducts anti-racism workshops. Lisa hopes that the lessons learned from the civil rights movement and the lives lost will never be forgotten, but always present to help us to remember never to repeat the horrible evilness of that time. Now for our speaker, Lisa McNair. Hello, um, my name is Lisa McNair. And I am the younger sister to Carol Denise McNair, one of the four girls killed in the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. Thank you so much for having me today. Main Street, I consider to be one of my other church homes. So 
I wish I was there in person with you all, but I'm glad that uh, I'm here today. Um, today, I'm going to just share with you a little bit about my family and through a PowerPoint I created to let you know a little bit about Denise and the bombing. All right, just So this is Denise. This is my dad's favorite picture of her. He shot this of her shortly before she was killed with her little camera, and he didn't even develop it till um, much, much later and realized what a gem he had. Uh, Denise, as I said, was killed uh, with three other girls. This is Carol Robertson and Addie Mae Collins and Cynthia Wesley. They were all 14 years old and starting their freshman year in high school. Denise was the youngest of the four girls. She was 11 at the time and uh, the only child that my parents had. Uh, they had tried to have other children since they had her. They had her a year after they got married, but um, for 11 years they tried and had not been successful. So you can imagine how horrible that was to try to have a child and not be able to but, and take your child to church one day where they should be safe and she was killed. But God is good and he is faithful and people prayed and almost exactly a year from the day that she was killed, um, I was born. And this is a picture of me and mama. And my mom and dad kept trying because they wanted lots of kids, but they only got us three. And four years later, she had, she and my dad had my sister Kim. Kim is a local chef here and nutritional health coach here in Birmingham with Beatty's Living Kitchen. The picture on the left that you see is um, of the basement the day of the bombing. You see the, the blast was so strong it created a, crea a crater. And if you look behind, you see the building across the street, all the windows are blown out. Um, people say that were miles away that they heard and felt the blast. On the right here is a picture many of you may have seen in history when people talked about the bombing. You see history, I see family. This is my grandmother, my mother's mother, uh, my cousin Lynn, my aunt Juanita, my mother's sister. And this is uh, her putting her hands on my mother's neck, trying to console her. Uh, They're standing across the street from the church when my granddaddy owned a dry cleaning studio. And uh, this little girl here who you see from the back is my first cousin, Lynn. And Denise and Lynn were two sisters' first cousins, or two sisters' daughters, and they were first cousins. And they did everything together. They went everywhere together. And um, we feel, because my auntie didn't go to church that Sunday and she didn't take the children, she had a newborn who was sick and didn't, and Lynn didn't go. But we feel like if they had been at church that day, we would have lost two children at the bombing. This is a brick that was um, found embedded in her skull. And the um, coroner, the um, funeral home people took it out and they put it with her special effects and gave it to my grandmother years later in a box of her special effects. And um, years later, my grandmother opened it up when all the grandkids and everybody was over to her house and told us that that was what it was. Um, I was at the funeral home today uh, talking with a guy that um, knew Mama and Denise. And he said that Denise was the first body he'd ever seen that died. And uh, she he was around her age, but he did, even though they made her look nice, she, she did remember some wrinkles in her forehead. So that concrete brick must have been right here. And I don't know why they put that in the box with the effects. I, I don't know, it's weird, but um, there it is. Um, this is Sarah Collins Rudolph. What people don't know is there were five girls in the bathroom that day. And Sarah was the only one that survived. She had come in the bathroom later and she was standing just far enough away from them that she didn't get killed. But um, she did lose an eye 
and is blind in one eye. And, um, but she has a wonderful testimony. Um, this is her book, The Fifth Girl, that she just wrote, but she's a lovely person. Uh, the funerals of the girls were not all together. Dr. King came over the Monday after that Sunday and wanted a uh, mass funeral. But Mrs. Robinson had already prepared her daughter's funeral and she didn't want to change it. And he wasn't going to make her. So the other three girls were funeralized together. Denise, Addie Mae, and Cynthia Wesley. And you'll see over here, mom and daddy coming down the steps behind Denise's casket. Then over here to your right uh, is a picture of mama at the, um, they told me this was at the cemetery. And when they were burying her, she just collapsed and someone caught her. And this is mom and daddy and I miss them so much. And I think they're the best parents in the whole world. Um, this picture on the left was a couple of days after she was killed. And the picture on the right is a picture of them at daddy's 90th birthday party. Um, they could have taught us to hate and hate all white people and just be very bitter and angry. But that wasn't who they were. And they taught us to love and to love everybody. And that's what we do to this day. We take each person as Christ loves us. And he looks at each person individually and loves everybody. Um, I think another reason that we were taught to love was um, daddy didn't go to church with mom. Daddy went to his own church. He went to a small Lutheran church that may have had more around two, 300 members. And all the members were black except for five people. And those people were the pastor, his wife, and their three kids. So that gave me the wonderful opportunity to know some white people who didn't hate us, but actually loved us and didn't mean us ill will. And so this is a picture of um, me at the blessing. I was blessed in, at the uh, Lutheran church and baptized at the... Um, Baptist church with mama. So I'm covered all the way around. Uh, and this is my grandmama. Uh, some of you may have met her. If you knew my auntie and uh, me and mom and daddy here, then this is Pastor L. Wanger with his wife and who is uh, very much with child and one of daddy's good friends. So the L. Wangers are wonderful people. They were active in the movement. They are still active in the movement. Uh, the wife got arrested a couple of years ago, I think during some of the protest march. So they are still have our back and are great allies. Uh, my dad believed in public service. He wanted to uh, go into public service. And um, so he was elected as the first African-American in Jefferson County in um, 1973. And this is a picture of mama and daddy and Kim and myself during his swearing in celebration. Uh, there were originally four people identified as having killed the girls on that day, but that was 1963. But the first person was not brought to justice until 1977, 14 years later. His name was Dynamite Bob Chambliss, and he was brought to justice by this man. I'm standing with uh, Attorney General of the state of Alabama at that time, Bill Baxley. And he was just determined, even from when he heard about the bombing when he was in college, to one day be in a position to do something about it and about those people who committed that heinous crime. And we are all still friends today. In 1997, Spike Lee did the documentary or little girls. If you have not seen it, I really, really advise you to please take time in the next few days to go and see it. It can be viewed now on Netflix, Amazon, uh, HBO, and probably some other um, platforms. It is free. And um, it's a wonderful documentary that tells about the life of the four girls, their families, and what Birmingham was like during that time. Um, well, I think, and this is just my personal opinion, that the other people had not been convicted yet of Denise's bombing, and that one question they people ask in this 
movie was, well, that was one person they found. Well, what about the other people? And I think embarrassment set in. And shortly thereafter, the FBI um, uh, op- reopened the case. And the last people, two people who were living, were brought to justice. And they were brought to justice by Doug Jones, who was our U- U.S. senator, but was the U.S. attorney uh, at that time. And he brought the last two killers to justice, one in 2001 and 2002. So it took a long time to get justice. Justice was delayed, but it was not denied. In 2013, the four girls were posthumously given the Congressional Gold Medal, which is the highest honor that Congress can give. Um, The Congressional Gold Medal had to be put in the form of a bill. And our Democratic Congresswoman, Terry Sewell, and uh, who happens to be Black, and Spencer Backus, who happens to be white, and a Republican. Both wrote the bill together and they got it passed unanimously in both houses of Congress. And now y'all know that ain't happened been a long time. Uh, and so that gave us the wonderful opportunity to see the president sign the bill. So mom and I got to go to Washington DC and meet President Obama in the Oval Office along with some of the other family members and people who were involved in the trial. And um, this is us, him signing the bill at the Oval Office. And Mama always, you know, she didn't remember all of the day, but she would often remember that he hugged her and kissed her on her cheek. So that was a wonderful moment that I'll never forget. The bombing is something that affected the whole world. People all over the world heard about the bombing and were just moved by the fact that people would kill children in a church and thought how horrible it was. So the people of Wales uh, over there in England, Prince Charles and all those people, um, decided that they wanted to donate a um, stained glass window to the church. So this is the window of the Black Jesus that they donated. It is very, very large, as you can see by the picture on the right with me and Mama and the pastor of 16th Street at the time, Reverend Cross. And they paid for it to be um, made and put together and shipped and installed here. And it wasn't the monarchy or the government, it was individual people all got together all over Wales and gave small donations that came up with the money to bring this over to America. And I thought that was just beautiful. Uh, This is a picture of Denise and our cousin Lynn and one of our neighbors in our front yard um, having a muscular dystrophy fair to raise money for kids with muscular dystrophy. And I thought that was just the cutest thing that she would take the time to do that. And so I was looking at her funeral program and this was in the obituary for her. It said, Denise showed great leadership ability and love to be associated with children. She was also fond of helping other people. And I thought that was a great caption for this picture. And this is a picture that I shot of the four statues of the four girls that now stands across the street from the church. It's the 16th Street Baptist Church. They erected these at the 50th anniversary of the bombing of the church. And this girl here, the one in the middle standing on the bench is Denise holding up doves. And the doves she's holding is four doves. I think that's to represent one for each girl, but there's six doves. And that's of the two little boys who were also shot and killed for no reason later on that day. So that was a horrible day in Birmingham. But the picture also shows this other girl. This is representing Addie Mae Collins. And Sarah Collins, the one who survived, So that was the last thing she recalls before the bomb went out. My sister asked her sister, would she please tie the sash on the back of her dress? And uh, this, that's the end of my presentation. Um, this is my logo. And I, I travel the country telling the story, talking about reconciliation, talking about love and how we must have love and not hate. And... Um, It's been a blessing and a gift from God to be able to share this. And I think it's 
my ministry now and I, I'm glad to, that he allows me to, for him to speak through me and these opportunities. So thank you all for your time and watching my presentation. I wish that somebody even tonight would testify to somebody and let them know that we've come this far by faith. Looking back on our history and the legacy of those who have come before us, it's obvious that the Lord's hand is on our people. And so tonight, even though we are here to celebrate uh, and commemorate black history and African-Americans who have made great contributions to the world, there is but one man who made the greatest contribution to humanity that humanity could ever have. And that is the person of Jesus Christ. And tonight, I'm praying that if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm praying that tonight you would do just that. The Bible makes it very, very plain for us in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved and i'm hoping i'm praying i'm believing that tonight someone will make that eternal decision to make heaven your home to make jesus christ your lord and your savior and if you're going to do that tonight i want you to repeat after me father god i am a sinner but i believe that jesus christ is your son i believe that he came that he lived that he died and that he rose again with all power in his hand and i believe that if i receive him into my heart i have a right to the tree of life so jesus i ask you now come into my heart be my lord and my savior forgive me of all of my sins and i receive you now by faith and it is so and not otherwise in jesus mighty name amen amen and amen and if you prayed that prayer with all sincerity just like that your sins have been forgiven your slate is wiped completely clean you are right now the righteousness of god by faith and you are a part of the body of christ main street friends and family i want you right now to go crazy in the comment section put some hand clap emojis in the comment section put some fire in that comment section because we now have new brothers and sisters in christ those who are now a part of the body of Christ, heaven is rejoicing. And we want to rejoice right here on earth with them. And we thank God for the decision that you have made even tonight. And if you made that decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want to know who you are because we want to celebrate with you. Put that in the comment section. I received Jesus. And when you do, everybody around you is going to show you some comment section love and they're going to send up some hearts and some thumbs up and whatever they have to do to show you how how excited they are that you have given your life over to jesus christ so go ahead put that in the comment section i received jesus we are in this world but we're not of this world and we are absolutely better together and if by chance the Lord has impressed upon your heart to be a member of the Main Street Church of God in Christ, the day you hear his voice, come on somebody, heart not your heart. We want you to be a part of us. We want to be your church family. And I'm telling you, I want to be your pastor. And so if that's you and the Lord has been, has been leaning on you and weighing on you to become a part of us, today is the day. Go ahead real quick. Put that in the comment section. I want to be a member and a member of our intake team will contact you with next steps. Come on, become a part of us because we are super excited about the opportunity to do life with you. And if by chance you say, well, pastor, I gave my life to the Lord tonight, or I want to be a member of the church, but I don't want to put my information in the comment section. That's fine. You can click that link in the description section, click to connect, and you'll be connected to a secure platform and you'll be able to give some information directly to our team and they will contact you with next steps through your preferred method. Listen, we are excited about our new brothers and sisters in Christ, the new members of the Main Street Church of God in Christ, and we thank God for you. Come on, one more time, put your hands together for those who are now part of the body of Christ and a part of the Main Street Church of God in Christ. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And even now, before we end the broadcast tonight, 
I want to give everyone an opportunity to sow seed into kingdom ministry. We thank God that he's blessed us to be able to do this. He's blessed us with the technology. But it's through your giving that we've been able to do things in terms of purchasing uh, equipment and software that allows us to do this, to bring you this great gospel through every means necessary. We thank God that in the pandemic, he has prospered us and allowed us to continue to expand uh, in, in line with what he's called us to do, continue to accomplish the vision that he has for us. And we're continuing to get out this great gospel. So help us tonight sow seed into ministry tonight. We know that God gives us the 100 percent. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. But then he tells us to bring ye the tithe into the storehouse. It's 10 percent of our increase. It's a dime on every dollar. Our tithe we owe, but our offering we sow. And so tonight I want somebody to, to sow seed into ministry. I want you to tithe tonight. And if you are going to do that in obedience with the word of God, here's how you can do it. You can click that link click to give and you'll be connected to our secure online giving platform you'll be able to sow seed directly into the ministry of the main street church of god in christ and also if you want to give via cash app you can use the cash tag dollar sign main street c-o-g-i-c and i promise you the lord will bless you for what you do listen i'm excited about what the lord is going to do we're looking forward to sunday morning we know that we have Sunday school at 9 a.m. on Zoom, and then we're in the sanctuary and online at 11 a.m., and then we're back on Zoom at 6 p.m. for YPWW, and we want you to connect with us this weekend. We're looking forward to an amazing weekend of worship, and I'm telling you, I see you in the future, and you look so much better than you do right now. God bless you, and we'll see you Sunday. 